Good evening, brothers and sisters. This is Ed Quiller from the Old Macedonia Baptist Church. Here to share with you another Bible study. Tonight's lesson is entitled Commitment. A study of Joshua 24, 1 through 15. So before you turn into your Bibles to Joshua 24, uh, I'd like to remind you of uh, something from one of our prior Bible study lessons, and it's it's all about God's faithfulness. To understand commitment, you have to understand uh, the faithfulness of our God. And just as a quick reminder, I want to give you, I want to share with something that we sh share something with you that we've shared before, and that is that God always does exactly what He says He will do, and He always acts. In accordance with his nature. So to understand commitment. You have to understand God's faithfulness. And you have to know that he always does. Exactly what he says. He will do. And he always acts in accordance. With his nature. Now turn in your Bibles to Joshua chapter 24. Starting from verse number 1. And I'll be reading from the King James Version. Of Joshua Chapter 24, starting from verse number one, and the word of God reads, And Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem, and called the elders of Israel, and for the heads, and for their judges, and for their officers, and they presented themselves before God. And Joshua said unto all the people, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Your fathers dwelt on the other side of the flood in old time, even Terah, the father of Abraham, and the father of Nahor. And they served other gods. And I took your father Abraham from the other side of the flood and led him throughout all the land of Canaan and multiplied his seed and gave him Isaac. And I gave unto Isaac Jacob and Esau and I gave unto Esau Mount Seir to possess it. But Jacob and his children went down to Egypt. I sent Moses also and Aaron. And I played Egypt according to that which I did unto them. And afterward I brought you out. Verse number 6. And I brought your fathers out of Egypt and they came unto the sea. And the Egyptians pursued after your fathers with chariots and horsemen unto the Red Sea. And when they cried unto the Lord, he put darkness between you and the Egyptians and brought the sea upon them and covered them. And your eyes have seen what I have done in Egypt. And ye dwelt in the wilderness a long season. And I brought you into the land of the Amorites, which dwelt on the other side of Jordan. And they fought with you, and I gave them into your hand, that you might possess their land. And I destroyed them from before you. Verse number 9. Then Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, arose and warred against Israel, and sent and called Balaam, the son of Beor, to curse you. Verse 10. But I would not hearken unto Balaam. Therefore he blessed you still. So I delivered you out of his hand. Verse number 11. And ye went over to went over Jordan and came unto Jericho. And the men of Jericho fought against you. The Amorites and the Perizzites and the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Girgashites, the Hivites and the Jebusites. And I delivered them unto your hand. Verse 12. And I sent the hornet before you, which drave them out from before you. Even the two kings of the Amorites, but... Not with thy sword, nor with thy bow. And I have given you a land for which you did not labor, and cities which you built not, and you dwell in them, of the vineyards, and vineyards which you planted, do not, you do eat. You did not plant, but you do eat. Verse number 14. Now therefore fear the Lord, and serve him in sincerity and in truth. And put away the gods of your father, served on the other side of the flood, and in Egypt, and serve ye the Lord. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So now I've read for you Joshua chapter 24, verses 1 through 15 from the King James Version. It's important that before we jump into this lesson on commitment and before I give you a, a fair amount more of context as to what you just read that let me just give you some general context of what's going on. So what you find here in Joshua 24, you'll find that 
Joshua is at the end of his life. He has been faithful to God. He was the uh, servant and the assistant of Moses. He was one of the individuals, one of the two individuals who were faithful to God whenever God had sent scouts out into the land of promise. Um, and therefore, he was one of the individuals that didn't die off in the wilderness because of his faithfulness to God. And now he has succeeded Moses as the man that was going to lead God's people. And he's led God's people, the children of Israel, through the wilderness. And he's led them through conquest of various parts of the promised land. And he's been through a lot. But here he is. He's at the end of his life. And there was a concern that he had. And and frankly, I share that same concern as it relates to my children and others. But the concern that Joshua had was he had a concern about the people's commitment to God going forward. And you have to understand this because a couple of things had happened whenever Moses died, there was a successor that had been groomed and that was ready to take the place of Moses. And I have to believe that in Joshua's heart and mind, he had to know that there was no adequate successor that had been groomed to take his place. And yet here he was at this position, a strong man of God, very concerned about God's people being committed to God going forward. Now, as a result of his con his concern, Joshua did something uh, that if you understand the full context of what you're looking at here, he did something that was truly, truly amazing. Joshua convened what was called a, a, a solemn assembly, and he convened it in a place that you wouldn't expect him to convene this assembly. He actually convened all the all the people of God um, to meet before the Lord, and he convened them at Shechem. And he didn't convene them at Shiloh. Now, that's important because the tabernacle was at Shiloh. And if you know anything about scripture and if you're familiar with the importance of that, that's where God's presence would come and visit in that place. And, God, and God's people would come to the tabernacle to meet with God in that spot. But here, Joshua has called the children of Israel to Shechem. Now, Shechem has some historical context that you need to be aware of. Shechem was a very important place. In, in, in the life of Israel, whether they recognized it or not, or whether you recognize it a lot or not. If you go back in Genesis, you'll find that Shechem was the place, the very first place uh, report, uh, recorded in Scripture where Abraham set up an altar to God at Shechem. And Shechem was also the place that many, many moons later, his grandson, Jacob, after having found himself in, himself in a backslidden state of his life, Shechem was the spot that Jacob decided to do away with his household idols and follow God. He made a commitment there at Shechem. And so now you fast forward some 400 years later. And what you find now is you find Joshua has called God's people and convened them at Shechem. And here's what begins to happen. In the beginning of Joshua chapter 24, verse number uh, one, you'll find that Joshua or somewhere around verse number three. And we'll see in, in just a second here. You'll find that Joshua began to speak on behalf of God and he began to remind the people of God's commitment to them and his faithfulness to them. So before we jump into the scripture, three things. One, Joshua was at the end of his life and he was concerned about the people's commitment to God going forward. What was going to happen now that he was going, he was dying? Would the people still be committed to God on their own volition? Or were the people just committed to God because there was a strong man or God, man of God around? And that's a deep question for you to consider for your family. If you leave here with your babies and your grandbabies and your grandbabies' babies, will they remain committed to God when you leave? This was the concern. That Joshua had. And so as a result, he convened the people at Shechem, which was an odd place to convene the people. But here they are. Here they are, because it's historically important to the people of Israel. And he begins to speak to them on behalf of God, reminding them of God's commitment to them and God's faithfulness 
to them. Let's look at what he had to say. So when you go back to the scripture and and you read verses one um, through three, you'll find these words. And Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and called the elders of Shechem. Call for the elders of Israel and for their heads and for their judges and for their officers. And they presented themselves before God. And Joshua said unto all the people, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Your fathers dwelt on the other side of the flood. In old time, even Terah, the father of Abraham, and the father of Nahor, and they served other gods. And I took your father Abraham from the other side of the flood and led him through all the land of Canaan and multiplied his seed and gave him Isaac. I want to pause because there's some things that I truly want to call out. I alluded in the previous slide that Joshua began to speak on behalf of God. I want to just prove that to you because in verse number two, he says something that if you're familiar with scripture, you'll find that prophets, when they are operating in the in the prophetic, what they will do is they utter these words. They say, thus saith the Lord of God. So now here Joshua switches from what he has to say and he utters the words thus saith the lord god of israel now look at what god says god says your fathers dwelt on the other side of the flood you remember terah and 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 nahor and abraham they dwelt on the other side of the flood and look at what god says he says and i took your father abraham from the other side of the flood now this is important for you to understand what he's saying to them a lot of times when we think of Abraham, we, we don't we don't uh, recognize the fact that Abraham was 75 years old when God called him. He had lived his whole life. But look at how he had lived his whole life. He was an idol worshiper. He was he was an idol worshiper. His father was an idol worshiper. His father's father was an idol worshiper. And God says, I took him. I chose him and I took him from where he was. And I led him throughout the land of Canaan and I multiplied his seed. Now, remember, the very first slide that I showed you was a reminder of God's faithfulness. He always does what he says he's going to do. And he always acts in accordance with his nature. And here, the very first thing God is reminding the descendants of Abraham and ultimately the, the children of Jacob or Israel. He's reminding them that I did what I said I was going to do. I took your idol worshiping forefather from where he was on the other side of the flood i took him and i led him through the land of canaan and i multiplied his seed and i gave him isaac because i said i would do it i did it because i'm committed to my word let's look at the rest of scripture and verse number four he goes on and he says, and I gave unto Isaac, Jacob and Esau, and I gave unto Esau Mount Seir to possess it. But Jacob and his children went down to Egypt. I sent Moses also and Aaron, and I plagued Egypt according to that which I did among them. And afterward, I brought you out and I brought out, brought your fathers out of Egypt. Now, to give you some context here, when you're looking in scripture and anytime you, you're reading the Bible, I want you to think of this. Egypt, in many ways, often re, uh, represents bondage. And Egyptians often represents that which would keep you in bondage. So anytime when you look at scripture from that perspective, like, for example, when you think of Jeremiah, whenever uh, he was preaching to a hard headed people and they wanted to go. Uh, uh, back to Egypt. Now, just remember, Egypt represents bondage and Egyptians represents that which would keep you in bondage. And even before you go to uh, Jeremiah, if you just stay around Genesis and, and Exodus, what you'll find, Exodus rather, you'll find that the, the people that God had brought out of Egypt would often look back longingly on Egypt. But Egypt represents bondage. bondage. And the Egyptians represents that which would keep you in bondage let me keep going so it'll make sense to you you need to understand that in spite of the people's idolatrous past god showed that he was committed and that he was faithful to bringing them from where they were which was in bondage and bringing them out now remember joshua is speaking here but joshua is speaking on behalf of god and god god is reminding 
the people of a couple of things. He's reminding them that, hey, you know, I took your ancestor who was an idol worshiper on the other side of the flood and I made him a promise. And you know what? I watched over my word because my word is my word and I made a promise and I'm committed to my word. Why? Because God is faithful. And what is faithfulness? That means that God always does what he says he's going to do and he always acts in accordance to his nature. Now here God is saying, I took your ancestor and not only did I take your ancestor, but I blessed him. I led him through Canaan and I blessed him and he had descendants like I said that he would. Remember, he was 75 years old. I told him he would have a baby and that he would have many, many descendants. And I honored my word because I'm committed to my word. But your descendants, his descendants, or rather you and your forefathers were down in Egypt, which represented bondage. And you were in bondage spiritually as well as in bondage physically. But I brought you out. Let's look at the word of God. And you came unto the sea. And the Egyptians pursued after your fathers with chariots and horsemen unto the Red Sea. And when they cried unto the Lord, he put darkness between you and the Egyptians and brought the sea upon them and covered them. And your eyes have seen what I have done in Egypt. Here we are again. God is reminding his people of what was happening. He's reminding them that he had made a promise to Abraham. He's reminding them that they were physically in bondage. He's reminding them that the Egyptians had chased after them, but he had done a miraculous thing and he had done it because he was committed to his word. He's committed to his word because he's faithful. And not only that, he's reminding them. And you saw this for yourself. You've seen that I've been committed to my word. You've seen that I've been faithful. You saw this for yourself. And ye dwelt in the wilderness a long season, and I brought you into the land of the Amorites, which dwelt on the other side of the Jordan, and they fought with you, and I gave them into your hand that you might possess their land, and I destroyed them before you. Verse number nine, then Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, rose and warred against Israel and sent and called Balaam, the son of Beor, to curse you. Now, remember, again, Joshua is speaking on behalf of God and he's reminding them of the things that God has done. He's just reminding them that you were in bondage. You saw it for yourself. You saw what I did to the Egyptians. But guess what? You saw what happened after I did that to the Egyptians, because after the Egyptians drowned, I led you through the wilderness and you were in the wilderness for a long time and I brought you into the land of the Amorites and look at what I did to the Amorites on the other side of the Jordan. They fought against you, but I gave them into your hand that you might possess their land and I destroyed them before you. And then even after that, Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, arose and warred against you and cursed you. But look at what God says. I want to give you some context. Now, 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 Joshua is reminding the people where God has brought them from and what God has done and what they've seen with their own eyes. But I want to take a minute. I want to give you some context and make this real to you. Remember where I said Egypt is representative of bondage. And the Egyptians is representative of that which would keep you in bondage. Well, you may not be in Egypt, but many of us are struggling with sin and we're bound by sin and we're in bondage. I want you to see something that happened in Scripture. You just saw it. In Joshua chapter 24, here's some context I want to get you. In spite of the fact that God had delivered them, a couple of things were true. And, and those things pertain to you as well. In spite of the fact that God delivers you or has made deliverance available to you, I want you to be mindful of one thing. And that is that the Egyptians will not let you go easily. You hear what I just said to you? Remember that Egypt represents bondage and the Egyptians represents that which would keep you in bondage. And so now uh, uh, here the scripture is showing us that the Egyptians will not let you go easily. In spite of the fact that God had done miraculous things to bring his people out, the Egyptians still chased after them all the way to the point of the Red Sea. And it wasn't until God did another miraculous thing to continue bringing them, continue delivering them that the Egyptians relented. Let me tell you something. Your sin is not going to let you go easily. God did what he did for the children of Israel because he's committed to them. 
because he's faithful and God does what he's done for us in our lives because he's committed to us and he's faithful to us. But don't you think for one second that the Egyptians will let you go easily? Don't you think for one second that that addiction that God brings you off, you out of won't continue to keep calling out to you? Don't you think for one second that that thing that you struggle with won't chase after you even into the quote Red Sea? But here God is showing that in spite of where you came from, in spite of what had you bound, I'm committed to you because I'm faithful. The Egyptians won't let you go easily. The next thing I want to call you out just from a contextual perspective and apply to you as well is that don't you think for the second for a second that being delivered and being brought out means that the wilderness won't have some challenges for you. And what I mean by that is God had brought the Israelites out of Egypt. And then God had brought them through the Red Sea. I mean, completely miraculous things. But waiting on them on the other side of the Red Sea was the wilderness. And the wilderness has a ton of challenges. And oftentimes we as believers get hung up and caught up and tripped up because God has brought us out and God has done wonderful things in our lives. And as we do what Joshua is forcing the children of Israel to do here, which is to look back on our lives, we can see that God has been committed unto us. But oftentimes we get lost in the wilderness because the challenges waiting for us in the wilderness make us forget what was on the other side of the Red Sea and makes us forget what was in Egypt, the bondage that was there. It'll make us get to the point where we'll start thinking about the onions and the leeks that were over in Egypt. And if that doesn't resonate with you, just go back and you'll find that the uh, children of Israel ultimately began to complain against the men of God and saying, oh man, how we had all we wanted to eat in Egypt and we had the onions and the leeks. And so you're looking at all of those things you had while you were in bondage, but what about the whips on your back? And what about the way that you were treated? And what about how God had to completely bring you out for you to even have an opportunity? Don't let the enemy blind you to where God has brought you from and delivered you through. But being delivered doesn't mean that the Egyptians are going to let you go easily. It doesn't mean that your sin is just going to lay down. It doesn't mean that the wilderness won't have challenges. It will. And lastly, if you go back to that scripture, it does not mean that Balak will stop accusing or cursing you. Now, let me give you some some million dollar game. here. Listen to me. When you look at the scripture that we just got finished discussing. In fact, let's go. When you look at the scripture in verse number uh, uh, verse number nine, starting from verse number nine, it, it read, Then Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, arose and warred against Israel and sent and called Balaam, the son of Beor, to curse you. Let me pause. Let me tell you what had happened there. So here God had brought his people out of Egypt. God had brought his people into the wilderness. And now they're going into the wilderness. And as they travel through the wilderness, they 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 got through the wilderness and they ultimately began to go in and possess uh, their land. And as they were going through, they encountered the uh, king of Moab who hired a warlock. And all a warlock is is a male witch. And this warlock's name was ba Balaam, the son of Beor. And so he hired him and he told him, I want you to put a hex on him. I want you to root roots on him. I want you to curse him. And that's what Balaam started to do. He started to curse God's people. But if you look in verse number 10, God says, but I would not hearken unto Balaam. Therefore, he blessed you still. So I delivered you out of his hand. So essentially what ended up happening and follow me now, I'm, I'm going to tie it up. What ended up happening here was uh, Balaam, the son of Beor, cursed God's people. But because of God's commitment to his people and the covenant that he had with them, he turned those curses into blessings and he ultimately delivered God's people out of his hand. Joshua is reminding them of where they came from. But let me let me let me let me go back here because I said I don't want you confusing for a second that just because God delivers you. I don't want you to get to thinking that, you know, the, the Egyptians are going to stop chasing you or that the wilderness won't have challenges or that Balaam Balaam. Won't stop accusing you or cursing you. Now, Balaam represents the enemy of your soul here. Don't you think for one second 
that the enemy of our soul, Satan, is going to stop accusing you. It's going to stop cursing you. Don't you start, don't you think for one second that people are going to give you pats on the back and that the enemy won't use people to stop accusing you, to stop sniping at you, to stop cursing you, to stop talking about you, to stop hurting you, to stop betraying you. Don't you think for a second that the enemy is going to stop because God has delivered you from where he delivered you. That's just more context for you. But anyways, back to the script here, Joshua is reminding God's people of God's commitment to them and what God has done. And he goes on and he tells them in verse number 11, and he says, and you went over the Jordan and came up to Jericho and the men of Jericho fought against you and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Girgashites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, and I delivered them into your hand. Now back to what I said in the beginning, just because God is, is, is bringing you out, the Egyptians won't stop chasing you. The wilderness won't stop having challenges here as they got on the other side of that. They ran into Balaam and then they ran into all of these people that God had to bring them through in order for them to recognize what God said he was going to bring them to. But because of God's commitment to them, you can look at the latter portion of that verse where it says, and I delivered them into your hand. Mm -hmm. Verse number 12. And I sent the hornet before you and drave them out before you and even the two kings of the Amorites, but not with thy sword, nor with thy bow. And I have given you a land for which you did not labor and cities which you built not and you dwell in them of the vineyards and the vineyards you planted, you do eat of. You didn't even plant but you eat of them here. Joshua, again, is reminding God's people of God's commitment to them and where he's brought them from and what they've seen with their own eyes and the many challenges he's already brought them through and brought them out of bondage. And in spite the fact that bondage kept chasing them even into the Red Sea, made a way when there was no way, split the Red Sea, brought them through the Red Sea, dealt with the Egyptians. On the other side of the Red Sea was the wilderness and in the wilderness, there were many, many challenges, including having to be cursed by a witch and having to deal with the uh, Amorites and per Perizzites and Canaanites and Hittites and Girgashites and Hivites and the Jebusites. And yet, I delivered you through them all because I'm committed to you. Because I have a covenant with you and because I'm faithful to you. And I sent the hornet before you and drove them out before you, even the two kings of the Amorites. But it wasn't your sword and it wasn't your bow. It was me. And I've given you a land that you didn't even work for and cities that you didn't build and you're eating from vineyards that you didn't plant. Now, let me show you something here. And this lesson won't be long. This is going to be right to the point. If you look at this scripture in the entirety of Joshua chapter 1, uh, I mean, chapter 24, starting from verse number one all the way through verse number 15, you see a couple of things. You see a couple of things. One, you'll find that God reminded his people that it was him and it wasn't them. But if you look closely, you will see that God says uh, a variation of the of these three words 10 separate times. And the three words and the variations that you will see is and I or I should say two words. And I, he said it 10 times. He says, and I took your father Abraham from the other side of the flood. And I gave unto Isaac, Jacob, and Esau. And I gave unto Esau, Mount Seir. I sent Moses also and Aaron. And I played Egypt. I brought you out. And I brought your fathers out. And I brought you into the land of the Amorites. And I gave them into your hand that you might possess their land. And I destroyed them from before you. I delivered you out of his hand and I delivered them into your hand and I sent the hornet before you which drave them out before you and I have given you a land for which you did not labor and cities which you didn't build and you had eaten vineyards that you didn't plant. God reminded his people that it was him and it was never them and children of God. I'm reminding you today that it was never us. It was never you. It wasn't your sword, it wasn't your bow, but it was his commitment and his faithfulness 
unto us that brought us to this point. Now, it wasn't your education. It wasn't your intelligence. Who gave you the intelligence? It wasn't your ability. Where did you get the ability? It wasn't that you look good. Who formed you from the dust of the earth? It wasn't that you were strong. Who gave you might in the activity of your limbs? It wasn't that your seed was so good. Who gave you the ability to have seed? It was always him. And he did it because he's committed to you and I. If you go all the way back to Joshua chapter 24, verse number one, you begin to see that Joshua speaking on behalf of God, reminded God's people that, you know what, he took Abraham, someone who was a nobody, somebody that was an idolater. And he chose he chose him and he made a commitment to him by his own sovereignty and his own volition. If you go further down, you'll find that Balaam cursed God's people. And if you understand the context, then you understand that there are a couple of things that are true as well, which are one. Balaam had actually cursed God's people. Right after. God's people had showed out, shown up. And in spite of the fact. That Balaam represents the accuser. The one that accuses and curses. In spite of the fact that that's what the enemy wanted to have happen. God had a different plan because of his commitment. It's one thing that there's some revelation in that for you and I. See, God's commitment to God's people was a hard commitment. His commitment to his people was his word. And his word was true and it was steady because of who he is. And it wasn't dependent upon them being at their best. These people had turned their backs and complained against God so many different times. These people had rewarded God's faithfulness with faithlessness time and time again. And yet God still remained committed to them. So what does that mean for us? Well, let's go back to Scripture. Commitment is something that if we follow the example the example of our Lord is something that you do in spite of. And, and, and with that being said, and because of that, look at Joshua 24 and 14. Here is what we should do as an appropriate response to God's commitment to us. We should do exactly what Joshua was encouraging the people to do as an appropriate response to God's commitment to them. See, Joshua forced them to look back on everything that God had done. And I want you to look back on everything that God has done. For you individually and for us collectively. Listen, just by the by the numbers of it, the odds of us even being here If you're African-American, the odds of you even being here, the odds were always stacked against you. You weren't supposed to be here. Now, that's us collectively. Now, look at it individually. Let me tell you something, brother or sister. You weren't supposed to be here. Wherever here is in your life, you weren't supposed to make it to this spot. Look at the bondage that God has brought you out of your life. In your own individual life. Look back on some of the sins that you were in bondage to throughout your life. Look at how many times that you should have died and died in your sin. And look at where God has brought you to. You aren't supposed to be here. So Joshua implores God's people in in, in verse number 14 to do something. And I'm going to implore you to do the same thing. The word of God reads. Now, therefore, Fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth and put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt and serve the Lord. Really simple. 
An appropriate response to God's commitment is commitment. I look back over my life and I look back, God, where you brought me from. I look at what you brought me through. I look at how you brought me. I look at in spite of the fact that things may not be perfect or be the way that we want it to be. I look at what you've done. I can think back on situations I shouldn't have ever made it out of. And now the appropriate response to your commitment to me God is my commitment to you now therefore fear reverence the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth not for play not for show but serve him in sincerity and in truth and put away the God's little g which your father served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt. And I want to pause right there because, you know, we oftentimes think it's just talking about, you know, false deities, you know, Islam and Buddhism and, you know, Confucius and all those guys. Yeah, that's part of it. But it's the other things that we place as idols in our lives, put them away and serve the Lord. The call for us is to meet commitment with commitment. The appropriate reply to everything that you've done to me, God, or for me, God, is for me to commit. Or if my goodness, if you've fallen away to recommit. Understanding, God, that you love me so much. That you gave your son. To die for me. Brothers and sisters, God is committed to us. And what we should do as a result of that is commit and or recommit back to him. But. Verse number 15. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord. Choose this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you do dwell. But I love what what, what Joshua what Joshua does here because he didn't give the people time to even reply back to him. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Now, this is this is a well uh, studied and well quoted verse. So I won't spend a lot of time there. But Joshua is really laying down a profound spiritual truth and I want to call your attention to it. And in order for you to get it, I want you to go to Romans 6 and 16. Romans 6 and 16. Now let's look at what, what, what Joshua was saying to them and what God is saying to us today. And let's tie up this whole discussion on commitment. In Romans chapter 6, verse number 16, Paul is writing to the church at Rome. And he's saying, Know ye not, that to whom you yield yourself servants to obey. His servants you are to whom you obey. Whether of sin unto death. Or of obedience unto righteousness. And then you, you can read the rest of it for yourself. He expounds a little bit more. But here's what it's telling us. You don't have a choice as to whether or not you will serve. Someone or something. Oh you will serve. So there's some people out there who mistakenly say, well, you know what, I, I'm going to do what I want to do. Well, by default, you are serving the enemy. And what scripture is really showing us is, is, listen, you need to understand that whatever you yield yourself to. That's who you are a servant or what you are a servant of. Whether it's money in the pursuit of money, it's people in people's opinions, whether it's the things of this world, whether it's your gratification of your own flesh, whatever you yield yourself unto, that is whom you are a servant of. So my question, my brothers and sisters, to you, as we're talking about commitment and we've been shown through Joshua chapter 24, 
how God was committed to the people of Israel. And now we are now taking that and we're applying that to our lives because he has been equally or even more so committed unto us. My question unto you, my brother and sister, is to whom will you commit and to whom are you committed to? See, it's not a question. It's not a question that you will serve someone. Not a question. You will. Whether you recognize it or not change doesn't change the reality. You know, for many years, people thought the earth was flat. They wrote books about it and had debates about it and they did all of this other good stuff. But you know what? It didn't change the reality of the matter that the, that the world was not. And I say that to say this. You may not realize that you're going to serve somebody. And you're going to serve something, but it doesn't change the reality. You will. You still will serve someone. So whom will you commit to tonight? Look over your life. Look back at how God has brought you out of, quote, Egypt. And that's bondage, bondage to sin. All of us have been in bondage to sin to something at some point. Look at how God has brought you out of the various periods of your life. Look at how certain things happened to you that the enemy intended to kill you in. And how God has been faithful to you because he always does what he says he's going to do. He's committed to you. Look at how God has provided for you. In the midst of a famine, he still keeps providing for you. There's been people throughout this pandemic that we are in right now that lost everything. And some of us, God is still keeping while they were losing, you've been gaining. Look at God's commitment to you. There have been families who lost whole families. And even if we've been touched with the hand of bereavement, we didn't lose our whole family. Look at God's commitment to us. The enemy intended this to be one million times worse than it is now. And yet God is still keeping us. So the appropriate response to commitment is commitment. My brothers and sisters, to whom will you commit? Let us pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for the visitation of your spirit. Even over the airwaves. God, we know that you are God everywhere. In person, through the internet, you are still almighty God. And God, we're grateful. Thank you, Lord, for your commitment to us. Thank you, Father, for your faithfulness to us. Thank you, God, for carrying us over the rough roads. For cradling us, God, through the rough seas. For comforting us, God, through the rough moments of our lives. For speaking peace, Lord, to our hearts. In times of turmoil. For being faithful to us, God, when we've been faithless to you. For being a deliverer, God, in Egypt, even when we turn back into Egypt. Thank you, Lord. We thank you, God, because, Lord, your faithfulness to us is amazing. We thank you, God, that you called us from the founding of the earth, Lord, to be yours and to be set apart. Oh, how we need your help, God, to walk. In a manner that's pleasing unto you. We need you now, God. In every second of every day, we need you, God. Some listening to this are hurt. Some listening to this are confused. Some listening to this, oh God, are downtrodden. Some have been going through for so long, God, they just can't see any type of light at the end of the tongue. I pray for peace, strength, wisdom, and your direction. 
But Lord, I pray that you put it in our hearts to be like Joshua. I pray, God, that you give us a mind, Lord, and in spite of what the rest of the world is going to do, in spite of what our neighbors might do, in spite of what our church members might do, in spite of what our family members might do, God, let us be like Joshua. I pray that you raise up a generation of men and women that will say, as for me and my house, that we will serve you. Until serving days are done on this side. I pray, Lord, for strength and courage. I pray against the plans of the enemy. I pray for restoration, Lord, in those places that the enemy has torn down areas of our lives, our communities, our homes, our families. And I pray, Lord, that you give us a spirit that was within Joshua to make a commitment unto you. We need your help to do it. So please strengthen us and please keep us until we meet again. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen.